Today we're exploring the question, why is there suffering in the world? As a pastor, one of the most common questions I get asked uh, by people about God is this question. If God, if the God of the Bible is truly good, all-powerful, and loving, then how can suffering exist in the world? Have you ever asked this question? Have you ever questioned if God is good? Well, if you have, you're definitely not alone. And if you have, then today's talk is for you. All of us, no matter what our worldview or our spiritual background is, will at some point in our lives have to wrestle with this idea of evil and suffering. Because the reality is, no matter what you believe about God, and whether you're a Jesus follower or not, all of us need to wrestle with this question of why suffering exists. Somehow we have to make sense of the pain and the suffering that we experience in life and the suffering that we see all around us. The amazing thing about the Bible is that it doesn't avoid the realities of pain and suffering. Suffering is actually central to the story of the Bible. The Bible gives meaning to our suffering and even offers a solution to our suffering, although it might not be in the way that you think. So while we could talk about this topic for hours, I want to just take the next few minutes and explore this topic together. Right off the bat here, something that I think is important to note is that sometimes we suffer in life um, because of our own poor choices. You know, Pastor Dallas talked about this last week, that we shouldn't blame God for the things that I am responsible for. For example, if, if I become broke because I spent all my money on fancy things um, and expensive vacations, that's not God's fault, right? That's my fault. That's, I'm responsible for that. Um, or if I stay up all night, you know, watching movies, uh, I love watching movies, so it's really hard to, to hit that pause button and to stop. But, but if I stayed up all night watching movies and you know, eating chips and drinking sugary drinks, and if I felt really lousy the next morning, that's not God's fault, right? <laughs> that's my fault for making the decision to keep watching. I'm responsible for that. So right from the start, I think we need to be honest about that. Sometimes we suffer because of our own poor choices. And to help illustrate this point, I wanted to show you a few different uh, memes that I found online that I've, I thought were quite um, humorous. So here's uh, a picture in the playground. I've made a huge mistake. Sometimes I feel that way in life. I don't know if you've been there. Um, here's another one. When you wake up late and rush out of the house in the morning, if you look at his shoes there, <laughs> he, has, he has one shoe, uh, one brown shoe, one black shoe. Next one here, engineering fails. <laughs> if, if you were to have me build anything, um, it could result in something like that. So here's another one. Picture of my kids getting ready to leave the house. We were late 10 minutes ago. <laughs> and one more. I need to stop buying stupid things when I get paid. Me when I get paid. <laughs> and now it's easier than ever with Amazon, right? So we're often affected by the, the choices that we make. And the good news is that we can avoid a lot of those kinds of problems by choosing to follow Jesus, by following the wisdom that we learn in the Bible, and by allowing the Holy Spirit to work in our hearts. We can learn to make wise decisions. So in this way, following Jesus will make your life better, because following Jesus will make you better at life. So a lot of the suffering that we face in life can be avoided by choosing to follow Jesus and his teaching that we find in the Bible, as we discover better ways of dealing with our problems. I know countless people who would agree that following Jesus has helped them to get better at dealing with family issues, dealing with their finances, dealing with emotions, and so on. However, 
There are other times when we suffer for reasons beyond our control. We all face hardship in life. And the myth that I want to address today is a popular myth in our culture. The myth is that good things happen to good people and bad things happen to bad people. There's this idea that if you put something good out into the universe, that the universe will send good things back to you. But if you do bad things, then bad things will come back. And the reason why I think this idea is so appealing in our culture is that if this were true, then that gives me a level of control over what happens to me in my life. But let's face it, even being a follower of Jesus, no matter how strong your faith is, no matter how hard you try to do the right things and make wise decisions in life, the brutal fact is that we cannot remove all pain and suffering from our lives. We just can't do it. No matter how hard we might try to avoid trouble, none of us can live a trouble-free life, free from the effects of suffering and pain. So back to the question, if God is loving and is all-powerful, then why does suffering exist? Well, the answer to that question is that if love is a choice, then there is potential for suffering. If it's possible to love, then it's also possible to experience pain. Why? Well, in order for love to be possible, we need to be able to choose love. God gave us the ability to choose. He gave us free will. And God gave us the ability to choose hate or to choose love. He gave us the ability to make good choices and to make bad ones. And that's what makes suffering possible. If he didn't give us the ability to choose, then we wouldn't be able to choose him. So why did God give us free will then? That's because he didn't want us to be like a robot that just does what they're programmed to do. He wanted to have a relationship with us. He wanted to have a family. God loves us. He wants us to receive his love, and he wants us to love him back. For who he is. And in order for love to be possible, we need to be able to choose love. That's how important love is to God. So in order for love to be possible, we need to have the freedom of choice. So the only way to remove all suffering and evil is for God to take away our freedom to choose or to remove people entirely. But God chose to give us the ability to choose. So what does the Bible say about this? Well, the story of the Bible can be summed up pretty well in just four words. Creation, fall, redemption, and restoration. So the story of the Bible begins with God. Uh, God creates this beautiful world and he creates humans and everything is perfect. This is the part that we call creation. Unfortunately, that perfection only lasts for a few pages and things start to go downhill pretty fast when sin enters the world. The humans turn away from God. They choose to take a hold of power and control for themselves. And in that moment, along with sin, suffering and death entered the world. Sin kind of set off this chain reaction, in a sense, and opened the door for all of these other things to come into the world as well. Suffering, sickness, death, pain. This is the part of the Bible that we call the fall. And this is how pain and suffering entered the world. And for centuries, we read in the Bible about the struggles of humanity because There was no permanent solution to reverse the effects of sin, suffering, and death. But God promised that one day there would come a permanent solution that would be able to deal with sin 
and the effects of sin once and for all. And that's where Jesus entered the picture. God didn't just give up on people and walk away, but he stepped down into the mess that was created. And, and, and he stepped down into our world in the biggest rescue mission in history. And he demonstrated that he has power over sin and the consequences of sin. So I want to turn to John chapter 9 with you today where Jesus and his disciples stumble upon a blind man. Uh, John was a disciple of Jesus and an eyewitness of the ministry of Jesus when he was here on earth. And John writes, as he went along, he being Jesus, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, which means teacher, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus, but this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. As long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. After saying this, he spit on the ground, made some mud with the saliva, and put it on the man's eyes. Go, he told him, wash in the pool of Siloam. This means scent. So the man went and washed and came home seeing. So here Jesus sees a man that was blind from the time he was born. He couldn't see. And his disciples ask, ask him, like, what, what happened with this guy? Like, what's the deal here? Did, did he do something wrong? And that's why he's blind? Or did his parents do something wrong? See, the Jews in that culture had a, a similar assumption that many people have today. That good things happen to good people. And bad things happen to bad people. So if this guy had to live with blindness, then he must have done something bad, or at the very least, his parents must have done something bad. And God must be punishing him for that. That was the assumption that they had. And the disciples were correct to assume that there's a connection between sin and suffering, but where they got it wrong was that they also assumed that it must have been the man uh, or his family that sinned. Jesus doesn't deny that there's a connection between sin and this man's suffering, but he does correct their thinking and he clarifies that there is not a direct kind of cause and effect relationship between this man's disability and sin in this man's life. The truth is that the global consequences of sin were continuing to cause suffering and destruction everywhere just like we continue to experience today. So when we say that good things happen to good people and bad things happen to bad people, I think Jesus would be saying the same thing to us today that he said to the disciples, that it isn't that simple. And instead, I think that he would want us to focus on something a bit more important. What does Jesus say? He says that this blindness happens so that the works of God might be displayed in him. Jesus is saying that instead of focusing so much on why this man is sick, instead turn your attention to what God might be able to do in this man's life and in this situation. When we ask the question, why? Why is this happening to me? Or why is it this way? That causes us to think more about ourselves and to feel sorry for ourselves. It's okay to ask that question, but we might not always get a clear answer to that question. But when we focus instead on asking the question, what? What can God do in and through this situation? And what might he want to say to me right now in the midst of this circumstance that I'm facing? That takes our focus off of ourselves and shifts our focus to the only one who is actually strong enough 
to do something about it, who's strong enough to save. And in this moment, Jesus is going to show that he has power over illness, power over the consequences of sin, power over suffering, and points to the fact that he has power even over sin itself. There are multiple instances where Jesus says to people uh, in, in the Gospels, he, he, where he says to people, your sins are forgiven. One is uh, recorded in Luke chapter 5 when a, a paralyzed man is brought to Jesus by some friends, and maybe you've heard this story before. They lower him through a roof to see Jesus. Uh, the other time is when Uh, Jesus is eating at a Pharisee's house, and a woman comes and pours perfume on him. In both instances, uh, when Jesus said, your sins are forgiven, it caused quite a commotion. Because by saying that, he was making a statement that Jesus was in fact God, because only God can forgive sins. But Jesus, even though he was perfect and never sinned, and even though he has power over sin, he experienced what it was like to be in our world, to be with us in our world that's affected by sin and suffering. And while he didn't deserve it, he chose to walk that path of suffering. You know, as Christians, we don't believe that good things happen to good people, and bad things happen to bad people. What we believe as Jesus followers is that the worst, uh, the only person in the history of the world who was perfect suffered the worst possible suffering and death that anyone could ever suffer. And all of that so that the devastating consequences of sin could be reversed. This is the part of the story of the Bible that we call redemption. Romans 6.23 says that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Sin always leads to suffering. It always leads to death. But Jesus ultimately defeated sin and death when he died and rose again. And that's very good news for you and me. The good news is that we are perfectly secure when we put our trust in Jesus. And this is where I think a lot of us sometimes get mixed up because we think that Jesus should be security against suffering, that he should protect us from suffering against the the storms of life. He's not security in that way. Jesus himself said in this world, you will have trouble. But while Jesus is not security against the storms of life, he is perfect security in the storms of life that we face. He is with us in our suffering. He understands physical pain. He was tortured. He was beaten. He understands feelings of despair. He understands what it's like to feel alone. If you've ever felt lonely, he understands that. He understands the feeling of rejection. He understands betrayal, even. What it's like to have friends turn on you. He understands anxiety and depression. He knows it all. He's experienced every kind of suffering there is to experience. And yet he never sinned. And he never, ever abandons us, as we just sang about earlier. He never abandons us in our moments of need. We're confident that a better day is coming, that one day God will wipe every tear. Revelation 21, 4 says, He will wipe every tear from their eyes. And there will be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. All these things are gone forever. And this is the part of the story of the Bible that we call restoration. And we live in this in-between time right now where God is in the process of restoring and healing the world. And we are not there yet. 
But by the power and the grace of God, you're going to make it through. And no matter what your situation is like right now, Jesus is with you in your suffering, in your struggles. So I encourage you today, don't give up, but continue to trust him. Jesus said in this life, we will have trouble. But he said, have courage because I have overcome the world. Life isn't always good. Not everything that happens in life is good. But God is still good. And one thing I know for sure is that God loves you. And I know that he is just as present with us in our struggles and in our pain as he is when things are good and we're on the mountaintop. Maybe some of you are in the middle of what you would say is a very painful season of your life. And if that's you, I want to encourage you today. David, uh, a man that the Bible describes as a, a man after God's own heart, experienced a lot of suffering in his life. Some of it as a result of his own choices. A lot of it out of his control. But in Psalm 16, he writes, I know the Lord is always with me. I will not be shaken, for he is right beside me. The Apostle Paul writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 16 to 18, he writes, Therefore we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away. Do you feel that sometimes? Like outwardly things are just not good and feels like my life is falling apart. Even my, my body, like... Physically, I just feel like I'm wasting away. Yet inwardly, we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Paul is not minimizing our suffering in some way by saying that our troubles are light and momentary. What he's saying is that even though life can be tough, the suffering is going to be minuscule compared to the incredible good, the incredible joy, the incredible peace that we will get to see and that we'll get to experience soon. I want to uh, share a story with you uh, about a man by the name of Nick Vujicic. His story is incredible. Nick was born without arms or legs. He just has one foot. And uh, when he was born, the doctor told his parents, we're so sorry we didn't know that he would be born without arms or legs. His quality of life will not be good. Uh, And so we are sorry that we weren't able to give you the chance uh, or the choice to abort him. And although it was a shock to them, Nick's parents raised Nick and cared for him in their loving home. However, you can only imagine the challenges that Nick faced growing up. He was bullied heavily as a kid. Uh, because he didn't look like the other kids, and he struggled with severe depression. He struggled and thought, I will never be happy. I will never be able to accomplish anything. I will probably never be married or have a family of my own. Life was hard for Nick, and when he was 10 years old, he even attempted suicide. But in his lowest moment, he saw a picture in his mind of his parents crying at his grave, wishing that they could have done something more for him. And in that moment, he realized that, yes, while I do have a life of suffering ahead and things are going to be hard and I don't have any answers, the last thing I want to do is give my parents a life where not only did they have a child without arms or legs, but that that child died by suicide. And so by the grace of God, Nick began this journey of seeking after God. And he prayed, God, 
give me arms or legs, because he knew that God could give him arms or legs if he wanted to, that he was capable of doing that. He's God, right? But he also prayed, God, even if you don't give me arms and legs, use me. It's not a great prayer to pray. Even if you don't come through for me in the way that I would like for you to, even if you don't end the suffering right now, even then, God, use me. Use my life and do something beautiful through it that only you can do. I don't know about you, but I think that's an incredible prayer. Nick began this journey of following Jesus, and there was one time uh, Nick uh, was out in the soccer field, and he broke his foot. And, uh, and he tells a story of how he, in that moment, he learned about gratitude, because he realized now... Here I am for three weeks. I can't even move now, just staring up at the ceiling. And he said, God, I will never complain about my foot again. Because now I realize what it's like to not be able to use my foot. And, uh, and Nick learned about what it was like to be grateful for what he had. One time, Nick was speaking at a church and He saw a boy in the crowd who also, like him, uh, has no arms or legs, just with a a little left foot. And he got this boy up on stage with him, and and Nick couldn't give him a high five, of course, and so he just put his foot on the little boy's foot. And they just looked at each other, and the little boy just smiled up at him, And Nick says in that moment, it's like his whole life just kind of flashed before his eyes. And he saw all of the the bullying, all of the suicide attempts, everything. All of the, the, the pain that he had experienced in his life. And he realized that this boy is likely going to face a lot of the same challenges that he faced in his life. But now Nick can say to this boy with confidence, if God can use me, then God can use you. Uh, Today, Nick is married with four kids, beautiful family, and he has inspired millions of children who've struggled uh, with depression. He's led countless people to a relationship with Jesus. And his message has stayed the same, that if God can use me in my weakness, then God can use you. God has a purpose for you. And the purpose might be to help someone who has been through something similar in their life. Or it might be something different. He might surprise you, but God can use the suffering in your life, to accomplish amazing things. In some strange way, God can and will often not only uh, only use uh, the suffering in our lives, but he can also redeem the suffering in our lives to draw us closer to him and to make us more like Jesus. We get to know God in very profound ways through our suffering. One way he might redeem that painful experience is he might use that experience that you, in your life to help someone who goes through something similar. God is able to bring good even out of the worst circumstances in life. Does God cause the suffering in our lives? No. Will he use suffering in our lives, and even bring good out of it, absolutely he will. If you know someone who is going through something right now, or if you're going through something right now in your life, then I want to take a few moments to pray for you today. And 
if you're at a place today where you'd say, I think I need Jesus in my life. I don't want to do life alone. And I want to, to give my life to Jesus and say, Jesus, use my life for the good of someone else. If you're at that place in your life today, then I would love to pray for you as well. Because I know that God has amazing ways that he can use each of our lives and all of our stories for his purpose. And so, maybe we'll close this way today. If you can just close your eyes this morning. And uh, if you're going through something in your life right now that just feels like a really heavy weight that you're carrying. Or maybe there's someone that you know that's going through something and you're just like, man, I don't know what kind of good can come out of this. Maybe if that's you, can you just put your hand up right now? Nobody's looking. But if there's just something in your life and someone else's life that you know, yeah, I see that hand. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, a few of you. Thank you. If that's you, I just want to pray for you. Father, I pray right now for those who are hurting. I pray that in whatever situation or whatever suffering they're facing in their life right now, that they would feel your presence. That you would give them strength, that you would give them peace, and that you would give them hope. I pray that they would know that they are never alone. And God, sometimes we would like the suffering to end. But Lord, we know that you are bigger than our suffering. And that you're able to even bring good out of these things. And so God, this morning, we just put our hope in you and our trust in you. And Jesus, right now, I want to pray for those this morning who would say, yeah, I, I can't do life alone. I need Jesus in my life. The weight of life is just too heavy for me. God, I pray that you would fill their hearts with a sense of peace. I pray, God, that, that your presence would be felt. And I pray, Lord, God, that you would... Uh, Continue to, to give them strength as they begin this journey with you. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.